How many of you guys are full time on your companies? Like pretty much all of you because you're paying rent in this space, right? How many of you are launched already? Products are all launched mostly. That's pretty good. How many of you with launch products are also making revenue yet? Yeah, almost. Okay. More of you should make money. Um, like Sean said, my name is Matt Johnson. I'm one of the partners at 500 Startups. Uh, I manage our distro fund that invests slightly later stage than the accelerator. I also manage our team of 12 awesome growth marketers that helps level up our companies and you know 10x them uh, both in and out of the accelerator so they raise more money from better investors and get richer later. Um, Previous to 500, uh, I sourced deals for uh, Charles River Ventures. Uh, I was the senior marketer at General Assembly. For a while, I helped start a pretty successful enterprise software company called Socrata in Seattle earlier in my career. Um, uh, so I'm talking about metrics and fundraising and especially in the context of early stage, like very early stage, like you guys. Um, and this is one of my favorite quotes, no sense in being precise when you don't even know what you're talking about. This is one of the classic errors that uh, founders make um, because they think metrics, oh, I'll check that box and have a lot of metrics. And uh, the point, pretty much the whole point of my talk today is uh, really deeply understanding your business and uh, what's important about it, what metrics are more important, what's less important, so that you can uh, both run your business successfully and also, you know, clearly articulate how your business works so investors will think you're A, smart, and B, know what you're talking about. Um, so basically, the reason metrics are super important is because if uh, you were trying to raise money with only one slide, uh, you could do it. You don't need any of those other slides uh, that the other guy was talking about. The problem is most people don't have this deck. Um, if you do, you can just have one, de one slide deck, maybe two, maybe you're an awesome team, but if you're not, like, you know, you guys probably aren't all like famous serial entrepreneurs yet, so then like your team page doesn't really matter. You know, what matters is like, does this, is this business amazing? And so I think all the, uh, or, you know, could it be amazing? Like, are, like, like, would an investor get excited? An investor doesn't get excited that like, oh, I had a job once, like, you know, or oh, I made a website once. Um, so, and uh, we see a lot of times early stage entrepreneurs, um, you know, even, even at 500 Accelerator, they say like, oh, you know, I've had this exit or whatever, or, and by Silicon Valley standards, no, you really haven't. You know, it's like maybe, maybe you made a website that went out of business and you sold its assets or something like that. Um, but what's really important are the metrics of the business because if you don't have a reputation, then this is pretty much all you have. Also, uh, like the guy right before me was saying, um, if you, uh, like at this stage, uh, it doesn't really matter what your idea is. Um, it matters if it works. So, like, I'm interested in hearing about your business, like, once I know that, there's something there. There's something like taking off. I'm interested in hearing your story. Um, that's why we think metrics are really important. That's why we have a growth and marketing team. That's why 500 is very like metrics focused and revenue focused versus um, other accelerators um, or just in general in the early stage investment world. Um, so pretty much web, web metrics are you know super super complicated and um, like the biggest problem is just as Jim Barksdale said, keeping the main thing the main thing. Um, and metrics are about like making better decisions. So this shit's all really complicated and can make you really confused. And but it's also like really powerful, like how you don't waste six months of your life uh, pursuing the wrong strategy because the metrics told you different and you weren't measuring that. Um, it's actually it sounds really obvious when I say it right now, but it's actually pretty difficult in practice and takes a lot of explicit focus to do this right. Um, so uh, pretty much what I think you guys should do is basically have like two metrics. It's like one is how fast or easy is it to make a sale and that's like a funnel. It could be acquiring a new customer. It could be like, um, you know, getting an existing customer to buy again. Maybe it's some blend of that. Um, maybe it's extending a subscription. And then, you know, depending on your business, it's like how cheap or easy is it to serve this customer? Like, you know, if you are some sort of uh, marketplace, then you have a cost here to uh, provide the service to find supply. If you are just purely a software product, you have these like you know, product development costs, they have like more features to build, but you know, if you're smarter about the metrics and you know, 
which features your best customers are using most, then uh, you know maybe you don't need to incur all that cost. And so, if you're measuring these things, then you can like drive these two things over time, drive drive them down over time, and then you have an awesome business that grows really fast and uh, has high margins. And if you can tell that story effectively with numbers to back it up, then investors are going to be falling all over themselves to invest in you. Um, and so th this is why I think starting with like just the simplicity of the drivers of your business and just like being able to talk art intelligently, like you've thought deeply about, you know, what matters in your business, what are the things that are like risk factors um, in the numbers, like, oh, I buy a lot of ads, but, uh, and that costs a lot of money, but, you know, my customers go away after one purchase or something that just you as a smart business person, if you were a domain expert, would understand. That's, those are the web metrics that matter, not just like a set of metrics that like Google Analytics or Mixpanel or whatever you use is reporting right out of the box to you that then you will like pair it to an investor or something like, oh, these are my KPIs. Like, aren't these good, aren't these good enough KPIs? Like, the point of web metrics and the point of, and I think what excites investors are like you being able to understand the numbers of your business and talk cogently and intelligently about them. Um, so um, the basic things you do track is like sources and there are conversions and often there are pixels associated with that. Like uh, if you're buying ads and, uh, then there's kind of a, like a third piece, which actually kind of goes, uh, you know, maybe in the middle that you might want to talk about, which is, you know, sort of a retention metric um, of, you know, after you pay to acquire a customer, um, you know, how much is that person worth to you? This is just as a as kind of a side note. I don't, um, uh, you'll when pretty soon when you start thinking about your web metrics, uh, you start getting into the customer acquisition cost um, and then the long-term value of that customer. Um, uh, one thing that's come up for us pretty frequently in a lot of our companies is that uh, uh, this long-term value is uh, really, really dangerous, this entire concept for you because you know, you're not in it for the long-term. Uh, you're in it to stay in business for the next like four months or six months or nine months or at that next funding round or you know, to get to profitability. Like, uh, A, you're in this for the short term. And so um, what matters is actually uh, the payback period for your customer acquisition cost. So it doesn't, yeah, question. What, what do you hear a lot? Or next business milestone. Like, like I, I mean, I think a lot of the companies we talk to um, that are relatively early stage in our accelerator, even beyond it at seed stage, um, this could, because they're trying to scale marketing, they think a lot about like, oh, what's our, like, our long-term value of a customer. Maybe it's like three years based on like their six months of data or something like that. And then, you know, potentially what's really dangerous if those are like ad-driven businesses where you pay big dollars and they're like, how am I gonna scale? Can I spend a million dollars a month on this? Um, because like I made some assumptions about like some user sticking around for three years. Like I think that's scary because I've been in those shoes. I think that's a terrible idea. Um, I think that's a good way to go out of business. Uh, and a good way to stay in business is to, um, you know, pay either explicitly in terms of advertising or, uh, you know, implicitly through like whatever marketing activities you're paying marketing interns to do or whatnot. Um, uh, to think of, think about like the payback period. So you know if if you are uh, if a customer becomes profitable in maybe like three months or something, that seems like for a lot of companies uh, uh, something that you might be comfortable with if you're actually trying to scale and spend meaningful amount of money. Um, so that's why I think payback period is super important because you know if you have something that's working, you want to scale it, um, and you can't scale it if you run out of money. That's what, that's, that's what I'm talking about. And I'm happy to talk a lot more about this like uh, after. Um, I was gonna have a bunch of time for questions. Um, <clears throat> so this is what I think at early stage. I think um, when I started my career in web analytics, um, you basically had to build your own tools because all the tools sucked like 10 years ago. Um, uh, now I think that all the popular tools are really good and track pretty much the same stuff and allow you to make funnels, particularly at your early stage where, um, you know, uh, 
what's most important for you is not having the most complicated metrics, but having like a few simple ones that you deeply understand to be representative of your business. Um, all the popular tools like the mix panels, even the Google Analytics, the Heap Analytics, um, a bunch of um, <clears throat> the mobile ones. Uh, Localytics is just one like mobile tool that I like that uh, I uh, was looking at recently. They're all pretty good. They all track pretty much the same stuff. Um, also, your own database is good. Um, when you are sort of building your quantitative understanding of your business at an early stage, um, there's probably going to be data that you will find that you are collecting uh, from from your app, maybe in your orders, maybe it's like your Stripe payments, maybe it's like your own user logs that you know might not out of the box be supported by like a mix panel or something, but you know is important. And so uh, I'm a big believer at early stage in just like uh, just uh, sort of uh, getting into your own real data and understanding. Um, Again, just like your real, the actual customers, uh, how they you know first come to your site or interact with your product, how they purchase. Um, so your own database is like great uh, for understanding your business. So I like to start there. Also, um, relatedly, all web metrics can be off by like 20%, and you're never going to fix that. So uh, analytics is um, you know like if you have a mixed panel or a Google Analytics, like the number of orders you get from it, um, and if you have like a conversion pixel from Facebook or something, the number of orders you get uh, compared to the number of orders uh, in your database is like often for various reasons off by like, you know, some reasonable amount. Um, if this is important to you, then you have a bigger problem. Um, if like you're at, at this early stage that this this sort of like inaccuracy is uh, so important to your business because you have such razor thin margins and um, <clears throat> you have such little signal about like whether your product and company is any good, um, then uh, then then you should basically have a better product. Like um, the the point of metrics in the early stage is sort of getting signal about whether you're at all even offering something right that the market wants. And you're because you're so early stage, you're like this brand new company that uh, no one knows about. And uh, it's not good enough uh, to just be like a business that kind of works, especially if you're trying to raise money. Like, like I personally don't really care if you guys want to be entrepreneurs. Like, that's nice. It might be nice for you. Um, you know, you might even make yourself like a million dollars a year just like owning a business. Um, that's great. Um, I personally don't really care that much because what I care about is uh, companies that have the potential to scale to like hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. Um, and, you know, if you're onto an idea that good, then uh, it's really obvious in the metrics that uh, you're onto something. It's like, uh, what you know, a big part of web metrics in, at early stage is related to giving you a uh, sort of like gut sense of the product market fit of your product, like how, how you know, much customers and potential customers like really deeply want what you need. And you can sort of see that and show up in, in metrics and uh, w what they say is there isn't like a rule of thumb, it's more like pornography. It's, uh, you know, you know it when you see it. And if you sort of feel sort of unsure, like, oh, I'm growing a little bit, you know, I'm not sure if I have product market fit. I have like some customers that, you know, like my product. That means it's not good enough. Like your product should be great and people should love it. And, you know, you'll see that in the metrics. And if it's like kind of flat to kind of up, it's like not good enough yet. Like make it great. And then you have your one slide deck and have it really take off. Um, so uh, similarly, what we advise is, uh, I thought this is like really awesome. You know, I've built a handful of uh, companies from like seed stage through like series A, series B, that kind of thing. Uh, and this is like one of the best little infographics I've ever seen. It was so good that we, we retweeted it sometime in the last year. Um, and idea is to build a product and a company instead of starting with a part and going up to like the full thing, you start with like a mini version that, you know, accomplishes the goal in like a really uh, ghetto, like lightweight, simple, cheap, um, half-assed way, and then you sort of expand up from that kernel, that fully functioning kernel, to a slightly, uh, you know, more polished and larger, larger product that basically still does the same thing. So, um, because you're, this is the correct way to build products. This is also the correct way to instrument your business. Um, so, the right way to instrument your business is not to throw analytic software on. Uh, your website or in your app and track everything to then like see what's important. The right way is to uh, 
come up with a couple a couple of metrics that really matter and think really deeply about your business, like I've said like four times before. Uh, and when you just have a skateboard, there's not a lot of numbers in there. It's like, you know, if you are selling some sort of enterprise product and you're doing some like customized code for your customers because you're an early stage company that hasn't really finished your product yet and you don't really know what the company is, what your customer is like, are willing to uh, buy from you, then <clears throat> there's pretty much just like two numbers. It's like, you know, how, like how much effort it takes to sell to that enterprise company in terms of like emailing them and getting them on the phone and getting them to like into contract or whatever. And then like how much work it takes you to serve that customer. So like, you know, one thing that you might find by those metrics is that um, I understand why that's logical and that's why I made this point because um, uh, A, uh, if you're doing anything meaningful, um, the vast majority of your customers are in front of you, not behind you. Um, so it basically like doesn't really matter what happened in the past. Also, when you start out, you don't know what you're talking about um, per slide one. Um, and you, you, you don't really know what the funnel is. Like, I mean, this is in general, like, like you personally, like might be the exception um, that proves the rule. Uh, in general, it is a pretty good rule that um, uh, the most common error with like your, you know, mixed panel or whatever is that uh, you uh, track a whole, you track everything and then figure out you're wrong or you name things wrong or your business changes, your app changes, whatever. And then you're stuck with a bunch of cruft and, um, it's just sort of messy and it's better to start from this simple kernel and then work outwards um, to instrument your business in uh, you know, a more and more detailed way. And by the way, you know, when you're talking to investors and, and sort of like um, describing the system that as your business, um, that is your business, the way you can communicate that effectively, you can articulate clearly, is to uh, not just have like a whole bunch of numbers, like here's a bunch of KPIs and a bunch of growth rates, but to like, you know, uh, talk about the hierarchy of the numbers, like, you know, here are the real drivers, these are the things that we work on every day, like these are the sort of like the drill down non-obvious things that you as an investor with like broad general experience but you know not as much domain expertise as me and my business like you know you might think is true but uh, actually is counterintuitive that we learned when drilling down from this one key important metric into something more detailed. Um, so that's why I think starting simple is uh, really important because also um, development co time is at an extreme premium when you're an early stage company and um, uh, it's really easy to spend like, you know, a third or a half of, you know, your CTO's time or maybe you are the CTO of your time um, uh, sort of like refactoring your analytics stack every like six months or something. You're like, oh, and you found out, oh, I wish we were tracking things this different way. Um, and it's, it just really slows you down. Um, so I, my m main point here is uh, it, it uh, is beneficial to you to uh, you know be uh, mindful about the kind of like analytics and technical debt you incur, um, and you know if you really have a rocket ship, like you don't need to track a lot of optimized shit, right? Like the important stuff is like the bigger picture stuff, and when the bigger picture stuff isn't working, then then and only then do you kind of drill down into the details. So that, that's how I think about like analytics and like product market fit and telling a story to investors. And we just happen to see it all the time. And I'm not saying like, you know, one like great experienced analytics person wouldn't like just really nail it right up front and track everything. Um, uh, it's just almost never true in my experience. Um, so, and I basically just gave you the uh, explanation for this slide, like because you're building like this hierarchy of analytics. Um, uh, or you're building your product in sort of like from a kernel on out, like that's, I also think you should instrument your business that way. And that's just sort of your, your question prefigured what I was gonna talk about in this slide. Um, because it really, it's like, uh, I, I've been in, you know, seed companies where it is like a six month project for like one person's time where, you know, there's a lot of like anger uh, in the team that's uh, that really uh, and grief because you're like well how do I even trust these numbers because like the database says we're getting 30 orders and like I only see 25 orders and like anyways um, I've also been in like series A and B companies when there's like 25 30 people or more where um, it's like this like massive rewrite of a whole bunch of everyone's time 
where you're gonna like build your own stuff. And also like no one analytics product out of the box uh, exactly maps to any of your particular businesses. Um, so usually there's something weird that you kind of like don't, that like you don't get, that doesn't quite fit. You like, you don't understand how it doesn't fit right away. And then um, you'll like cobble together some stuff. Like often it is uh, about, you know, uh, retention and user activity metrics are like stuff that, um, you know, might be stored in your own database to start with. And uh, you might not be fully capturing in your third party web analytics tool or your like uh, marketing attribution analytics. Um, and so often like one big class of problems is that like those don't map up, map together and then you have to like sort of learn how to stitch the right tools together for your product over time. That's right. That's sort of what I think. Um, ah, right. So um, the, the the reason this is entirely this is important is just because I deeply believe that uh, time management is the most important um, uh, thing, your most important problem to solve in an early stage startup because you have like two people or one person or three people, maybe like one of you is technical, maybe no one, maybe you outsource your development. Um, <clears throat> so you just like don't have a lot of time to fuck around with like, you know, doing analytics wrong or like spending a lot of time on the wrong marketing channel. Like, you know, you might find that, um, uh, you know, like Google AdWords are the best for your business. Um, or, you know, you might think that um, there are, uh, you know, you're gonna do like the five, like just marketing activities that like every other startup does. Like we're gonna buy a little ad, a few ads, we're going to like um, blog a little bit. Um, we're gonna, you know, try and do like influencer marketing or we're gonna do like some outbound email marketing or something just because you think like that's sort of table stakes, like all companies do this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, you have like very, like you can like th there are unlimited marketing activities to take up un un like the unlimited time of like unlimited monkeys, especially if you're doing something like content marketing or like you know building your SEO empire from scratch or something like that. Um, and you don't have time to do everything, but like it turns out, what will be true is that there will be one channel or something that will end up being the one that gets you your first million dollars in revenue, and it'll pretty much just be one. And the like the uh, deeper sort of like unique insight that you have about that one channel that works for you that isn't going to work for like other people, then the more likely it is that like uh, that one's going to work and you don't know up front, uh, you know, which uh, is which is going to work well for you. Um, so this is why I think it's just sort of about opportunity cost and choice because you could easily go out of business with like a great, um, a great product you know, selling to the right customers the wrong way if, you're, if you haven't instrumented it and you waste all your time uh, on that. Um, so I basically, also my last slide was I tried to Google for an image that was like, you know, how to impress VCs. There wasn't a very good one. This, so this was just the search results. They all kind of sucked. And some of them I don't even understand at all. So um, uh, the, the, how I wanted to tie this all together uh, was uh, just to um, reiterate what I've said a couple of times um, already in this talk about uh, intelligently um, speaking about your business in like a quantitatively detailed and like uh, uniquely insightful way that demonstrates your domain expertise and command of the numbers. You know, I'm not sure if uh, Sean has said this yet in your program, but um, uh, one of the most important sort of first filters that investors go through is like, do you know what you're talking about? Do I trust you when you're telling me numbers? Do you sound like you know what you're, like, like first I like filter on like, like, do you, are you ignorant? Do you know what you're talking about? Two, like, if you sound like you know what you're talking about, like, do I think you're lying to me? It, um, there's this, like, big uh, sort of um, class of initial, like, investor communication that's about building trust um, and sort of command of the numbers of your business. Like, you know, pretty early is, uh, you know, do I think you would do a better job uh, 
building this business than I investor would and if like I think I have a better sense for the numbers and like more insight into the metrics based on my shallow but broad experience then there's no way I would ever invest in you if you know you don't have this like well it's funny that you uh, would think that and I can see why you would because most other businesses in my industry that I've re in this industry that I've researched operate like this but the way I small startup I'm going to win against incumbents is like uh, I've found that uh, I have this other um, sort of insight to do things a little bit differently backed up by numerical experience and so that's why you should invest in me to disrupt these incumbents. Um, so th that's how like metrics at this really early stage uh, tie together with like managing your time right and sounding like you know what you're talking about. Um, and uh, I don't know how much time we have now. I guess we have like 15 minutes before lunch. I'm happy to like let you go or you can uh, we can just have a conversation about like anything that's come up more or less technical right now or more metrics questions you have, more fundraising questions, uh, anything like that. You can pitch me your business, whatever you want. Uh, it's, um, I, would, I would say it's qualitative and relative. So, you know, you'll probably be testing, uh, you know, maybe it's a handful of channels. Maybe it is like, you know, Google ads, Facebook ads, like, you know, SEO is something that takes a long time to build up, but, you know, you might have an insight that like this is gonna be a good channel for you based on like, you know, your domain expertise. Um, so it's something you might wanna be investing in for a while. Paid channels often have like kind of like a monthly spend threshold below which like, you know, knowledgeable practitioners think that, you know, the uh, you won't be getting enough signal, so you'll just be getting um, uh, sort of uh, wrong results, um, either false positive or false negative. Um, you know, and like I, I, off, I think that's almost like on the order of like five thousand dollars a month, frankly, on things like Facebook ads and Google ads. Um, that's kind of that, that's kind of how I think about picking channels, but uh, because it's hard to know, you know, uh, just objectively what level of signal is enough. Um, uh, I think uh, thinking about each channel like relative to the other ones and uh, especially uh, putting like a dollar cost on the organic activities that you might do, let you compare it against other channels. Um, you can also think, one thing I like to do is think about, um, you know, the price point of the, of the product, even like a little bit down the road, like, uh, you know, if you think that you are going to be selling a product for less than $5,000 a year, you basically, you can never pick up the phone and you basically like can't even email anyone. Like they just have to like, like a business has to pretty much like buy it themselves. So, you know, they're like channel, they're like outbound sales um, channels that, you know, may or may not be open to you be depending on your price point. Um, uh, so I, I think the, the like like the honest truth is um, uh, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's business partner, uh, has this approach to like sort of making data-driven decisions. In his case, investment decisions that he calls multiple mental models. And so uh, like he describes it really eloquently in you know being smart about a bunch of different like quantitative aspects, and then you know uh, sort of just uh, synthesizing those together into a gut feel about like what a channel is going to like maybe work out for you. One thing that's going to like scale with you uh, as your business grows. Uh, for instance, most channels get more expensive as you scale, and most early stage entrepreneurs mistakenly think that they'll just get better at it, and so it'll get cheaper as it scales. And usually, usually, if you're like really driving uh, a channel, um, you optimize as hard as you can, and that just keeps your like uh, unit economics uh, stable as you grow, as you scale. Um, rather than the opposite. Like early stage entrepreneurs usually think that like, oh, like I'll start here and like it might not be profitable now, but like I can drive it way down because I'll just get better at it and more experienced. And that could be true at constant scale, but if you're trying to grow by 10x, 100x, like usually it goes up in price. I don't know if that, that's just sort of my own personal experience, so I don't have like a pat answer for you on that. Yeah, I mean, I kind of wanted to unpack that idea of sort of trust and, and feeling like the person knows what the hell they're talking about. The, yeah, I do. Because, and we talked a little bit, well, I mean, I use the example of like, some, like I'll say, what's your acquisition cost? And they'll be like, oh, it's between 30 and $50. Okay, well, that's a big range. But what other mistakes, what other ways can a founder screw that up when they're asked about acquisition or growth data? What, what other sort of pitfalls? Yeah. You know? 
Oh, you know, it really varies by stage. Uh, one thing that's super common for early stage founders that's like a, you just don't even know what you're talking about, you're either an idiot or you're lying to me, is like the cumulative numbers versus, uh, you know, like week over week or month over month numbers. Um, I think another like meta point is just like uh, uh, not having like a thoughtful reason um, reasoning behind any of your numbers or precision that's because then it sounds like you read a blog post and you're like oh investors want to see these numbers and then you went and like found the found some version of those numbers in your business in like the cheapest like least thoughtful way possible and you're like here see look look I'm growing like this rather and that I mean I think that sounds like you don't know what you're talking about because it sounds like you just like haven't you, it sounds like you just don't understand your business that deeply um, that's kind of meta point that I think is most important um, uh, most dangerous one, I think, is this LTV that I talked about because uh, uh, there's a lot of like extrapolation to the, into a very uncertain future um, based on like very limited past data. Everyone knows what LTV is, just in case. Yes, if you don't, okay. Long-term val value of a customer, like lifetime value of a customer, like that sort of thing. Yeah. CAC has customer acquisition cost. How do you answer that question if you're in month two of your business and, and be uh, honest? That's why I talk about payback period because I think like if, uh, and you know, I was just talking to one of our portfolio companies that's one of the best companies that come out of 500 Accelerator with like best revenue and raised a lot of money and uh, so they're, they've set their sights really high and they're really looking to scale now because they have a few million dollars to do it with now. and. Uh, I was like, look, guys, like, um, I'm, if I put myself in your shoes, like, do you, like I said before, like, do you want to spend a million dollars a month based on this, cal this, like, assumption that, you know, your customers are going to stick around for, like, six months versus three months, like, in the future, or, like, nine months versus 12, or, like, buy, you know, six products versus nine products or something, like, you have no idea what's going to be true, you know, and you don't know, like, which group of which customers is going to have, like, uh, a long, you know, going to be, like, long-term profitable for you versus the ones that you have now that might be, like, some will be long-term profitable and some other groups of customers, like, will be uh, bad customers, but you might have them now, and so your data might be wrong, and... Um, you know, so if, if, if you, if you have raised this, they've raised this money and, uh, they like want to spend it. And so I'm like, look, like, like I would be so scared about this kind of LTV, um, uh, calculation. And in their case, like they're like profitable on like two months, I think, um, right now. And they were thinking to scale, they would start spending more aggressively, like drive their margins down. And I was like, well, Maybe I'd go for three months. Um, like I think that seems like a pretty reasonable like step forward to you know discover what the economics are going to be with um, you know fifty fifty percent more spend. Um, but uh, I don't know that I would uh, go out to like six months. I'd be fucking scared, you know, um, if I was spending millions of dollars and you know I was counting on you know spending like a hundred dollars for a customer that like paid me ten dollars this month and like you know, making that up, like, sometime before the end of the year, like, that would scare the shit out of me. Yes, I've done it myself. All the time. Yeah, I did it with my last business. I thought the payback period was two months, and it was coming close to more to, like, 3.5, four months. So it was twice what I anticipated, which has an issue on cash flow. It, it you know. doesn't, you know, like... Just what Sean said there, like, two months versus, like, three and a half... That is so within like any reasonable margin of error that you can ever imagine for startup business for startup like an early stage business like uh, even like there's like I, I don't there's probably like nothing you did wrong it's probably just the margin of error and it was like an assumption that just like was like one side of the margin of error versus another. Yeah. You're probably then, like, like tracking it all like just perfectly. I think so, but like every three months you know a lot more about your business. So it's like every three months you have this bigger cohort that you can look back on and just gets, you know, the resolution gets a little bit better. I, I don't know if there is one. I mean, if you say that the payback period, let's say if you said my payback period is two months, good. If you said my payback period is on the second transaction and on average we're seeing 3.75 transactions per customer, I'm feeling a bit better, like, okay, you really know the numbers, and you're not just saying we make it back on the second transaction, you're telling me that most of your customers perform, you know, more transactions. But I don't know, like, what, what is the, what's the sweet spot for that? 
it's hard well, to say. So I, I, I think it's really like a gut call and it feels like I can, I can use uh, analogs. Like, you know, if you have a credit card, like you probably would feel kind of uncomfortable like throwing down like all your expenses for the next six months, like right now, on a like putting it all on a credit card. You might even not even have a credit card limit that high, right? But you know, you might in like you might feel okay if you have like a good thing going, to, like you know, put down like you know, f first, last, and security on an apartment or something uh, to move to San Francisco to start your business, and you know, maybe that's like pricey. That's like a pretty you know, like like that's a pretty big hit. But you might not feel comfortable putting down like six months even if you had it or putting like six months on your credit card or something. Uh, so that, that, that's what I think. That, that's kind of what I think. Yeah, I think other things like most marketers, you know, it's you doing it or someone else, they're going to want to step up in terms of acquisition. They're not going to want to go, oh, we spent 5000 now let's spend 50000 Because if you do that, it tends to throw everything off and your costs are all over the place too. So you just want to like feel comfortable. It's like, okay, we spent 1000 this month. Okay, we're feeling better. Okay, let's ramp it up a little bit. And yeah. you're sort of there's stepping like, up. Like I said before, know. there's, a, there, there's a, a similar, there's a graph where you know, as your spend increases, like usually your cost to acquire goes higher. Um, because you know the first customers you get in any campaign are the ones that like are really interested in your product for whatever reason and maybe like actively looking for it so they're the ones that that clicked and then uh, you know first and then you know maybe they're always maybe they're always on Google or Facebook like on the lookout for that product and you know as soon as you start buying ads they're like shit I've been waiting for this forever but then you start to uh, scale up and then you're starting to find people that like especially if you're advertising in like display or Facebook where like people see the same ads a few times you're getting the people that are like well I'm kind of interested in looking this like after like a fifth ad or something or maybe and so those people are just because like they're not actively looking as much like they're going to be more expensive to acquire plus like there are other people that are like you know competing for the attention of uh, those potential customers and they may or may not you know, have more of an affinity for those customers than you do. As you go up in size, you're just competing more in the competitive landscape for attention. So, um, so like, you don't know, for Sean's point, like, your economics at, like, $10,000 a month are going to be way different than your economics at, like, $1,000 a month. Uh, right here. Go ahead. I see. And so you earn the affiliate fee. Well, so that's, like, the same as e-commerce because they're not, there's not, like, a subscription or anything. Um, but just your margins are a lot worse. So, so, so then payback period's a lot longer. Um, you know, you, you, well, you can track the transactions, right? Because that's how you get paid. Well, I know, but like you, you get paid your affiliate fee, right? So, you know, that, I mean, the payback period to you is like your net revenue, not like, what they spend at that e-commerce store. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like uh, it's hard in your business because people aren't like logged in and they don't have accounts and you don't see all the order flow. Um, so, you know, I, th I think it really is just um, your data won't be, the quality won't be as good. You're just going to have to live with that. But, the uh, you know, there are a lot of affiliate sites that became like membership sites, for instance, um, where like your data is a lot better. Uh, you could, um, uh, you, like, you'll see the repeat click behavior of people who are cookied if no one ever logs in, um, you know, within the cookie window. So that's pretty much as good as you're going to get in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, we, we can't go into too much technical details, but I mean, the main point is like when they're going to a third party site, you're going to lose some resolution. So, you know, Matt talked a little bit about UTM codes. If you're not using them, I would look it up and understand what they are. Once you know what they are, you'll start seeing them everywhere. And these are, you know, UTM source equals. The challenge is, yeah, you're losing a lot of that data. Some affiliates will let you pipe that data in and then they'll send it back out on sort of a, a, a postback or a callback when the transaction's complete. Uh, but yeah, bigger challenges. But there's there's probably bigger challenges to worry about that business. Primarily high churn, low margin. So there's there's other things you need to kind of overcome, you know, b before that. Hierarchy of metrics that matter. Like the bigger. Sean just said there's bigger problems. Like may maybe that's not your biggest problem right now. Yeah. Well, I think it's twelve. I don't know if. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the food's setting up. I was going to make you guys sit here for 10 minutes and just make your tummies grumble, but you've been so good. Let's break here. Let's thank Matt, everyone. Thank you. Yep.